Welcome to the F Mind Podcast with Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall, where we discuss all matters related to the behavioural, psychological and emotional aspects of trading and investing. Today our guest is Oliver Kell. Oliver was the 2020 US Stock Trading Champion, who produced an astonishing return of close to 1,000%. And just to put that into some context, given that 2020 was an insane year for stock market returns, the runner-up produced a return of 497%, which itself was an incredible performance. However, there is a lot more to Oliver than just great returns. His success is born of a deep humility and a respect for risk, and a process which somewhat surprisingly, when you consider the performance, came from a place of high risk aversion. Here are a few excerpts from this week's episode. Worst parts about winning that competition is, you know, people don't think you make mistakes when, you know, I'm like a walking mistake. You may go nowhere for five years and then, you know, over the course of like two to three years, you you, you really, really accelerate and, and start to have confidence in what you're doing. I had trouble making money because I, I, my stops were too tight. Like a lot of people can't cut their losers. <laughs> I was the exact opposite trade different markets, you have recall. And I think when that type of market comes around again, you're, you're better prepared to, to try to trade. it. And I think that's really how you put up big returns is, you know, having little returns consistently. And then, you know, having the humil- humility to admit when you're wrong. My football coach in college used to always say, you know, it was never as good as you thought it was and you were never as bad as you thought you were. <laughs> I, I love this to death. I, I don't think I could do anything else. But I mean, there are times when I just want to like, you know, bang my head against the wall. Like <laughs> That was just one minute's worth of excerpts. Now, normally when we're editing an episode, we put all the little clips and outtakes into this excerpt section. On this episode, there were so many highlights that it could have been a whole podcast in itself. So just letting you know, stay with this one all the way through. You will get so much out of this. Before we start, we would like to thank our podcast partners, TradeStation Global and the Society of Technical Analysts. TradeStation Global is a multi-asset trading platform with access to international markets, trade stocks, forex futures, and micro e-mini futures from one account. Leverage professional grade tools like Radar Screen, The Matrix, and Easy Language, an intuitive coding language for traders. And with TradeStation Global, there are no hidden price spreads, just transparent low commissions. To find out more and open an account, visit tradestationinternational.com forward slash alpha mind or see the link in the episode description. TradeStation International Limited is authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK and acts as an introducing broker to Interactive Brokers UK Limited. The firm does not provide investment advice or trading recommendations. Investment and trading involves risk, including possible loss of principal. At present, the TradeStation Global product is not available to EU residents. The Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, are another long-established organisation with a great reputation. They are a member-led and not-for-profit body who have been providing world-beating education to the trading and investment community for over five decades and so the needs of their members by providing outstanding online talks and webinars, regular newsletters, education, diplomas and continued professional development programs. Their home study course has been created by many of the world's leading minds in technical analysis and provides learning of a depth and breadth that is unparalleled in the trading and investing world. Listeners to the Alpha Mind podcast can obtain a 10% discount on the cost of the STA home study course. Visit alpha-mind.net and go to the sponsor section of our page to find out how to obtain this. Now, on with this week's podcast. Well, welcome to this week's Alpha Mind podcast, and we're delighted to have Oliver Kell with us. Oliver is all about the little guy taking on Wall Street and winning. Okay, Absolutely. so back in, back, in, uh, back in 2020, which feels like about a decade ago now, um, Oliver won the U.S. Investing Championship with a 940.1% return. So, yeah, nearly a 1,000% return. Just spectacular. And we've got Oliver on today because we want to know more about you know, the story that got to that and the things that were your strengths through that journey, your challenges through that journey. You know, some people will say, was it a blip? <laughs> you know, was, it, was it just luck? 
you know, we kind of want to know, well, what are your mechanisms? What are your tools that you use? And uh, yeah, so we're fascinated. But perhaps, Oliver, it would be good for you to guess, sort of go back in time a little bit and just tell us your story so far. Yeah, sure. So uh, I basically, so my dad was a market maker. My dad was the, the lead market maker in Lockheed in Microsoft in the 70s, 80s, 90s on the Pacific Exchange out in San Francisco. Um, so, you know, I, I, I probably, I wasn't blinded by the, the, the light, if you will. And, you know, thinking that you could just go trade and, and make millions of dollars or whatever, you know, I kind of saw the grind of, of my dad over the years and, and saw some of those ups and downs. Um, but, you know, my first memories are going into the floor on half days, you know, the market would close at one, me and all my brothers and my sister would be running around, you know, picking up paper and stuff. Um, and, you know, that was kind of what the stock market was for me was the floor. Um, and then I, I didn't think much of it. You know, I, I played sports. I went to college. You know, that was pretty much what my focus was. And then I got to my senior year and I had a buddy who was a couple years older than me who I was pretty close with, who was a prop trader. And, you know, I, I sort of started talking to him and he, you know, he sent me some, some books, some reading lists. I started reading it started talking to my dad a little bit more about the market, you know, with an actual interest versus just kind of knowing my dad was a trader, but not really, really caring what he did. And I went into the floor again with him, you know, when it was the ARC exchange, it was kind of a shell of itself. Um, you know, talked to some of his buddies from the floor, just got more and more into it. And I went to New York to kind of what I would consider to be you know, like a modern day bucket shop where I put up like 5k, they leveraged me up the hilt and we traded strictly off the level too. So, you know, I didn't know much. I, I was naive enough to think I could just probably come in and make money, which wasn't the case, but we basically would just trade. We'd look for big bids and big offers on the level two screen and try to position in front of them and use that that stock that liquidity is our out if we were wrong you know we were we were scalping for pennies pretty much um which i, I probably lost about half my money which thinking about the amount of capital we were trading uh for me to only lose like two or three grand was actually pretty impressive um because i really don't think we we had a strategy that worked all that well um so i kind of went home regrouped um, I was able to connect with these guys who were prop traders. You know, they had, they had a small shop in Stanford, Connecticut, five or six guys. Um, I got introduced to them by, by a guy, a guy I played footballs with dad, knew him, and, and he kind of connected us. And they did international arbitrage. So I totally, totally different from anything I'd had any exposure to. I, I was learning on the fly. I uh, was basically a trading assistant for two guys who were two very, very different traders. <laughs> you know, one of them was very conservative. He, he traded News Corp, which is a stock that trades between Australia and the U.S. He pretty much traded it every day, just day traded it, you know, tried to take, you know, a percent or two every day and was extremely consistent, but very low risk. And the other one was like a straight up gunslinger, you know, really, really, <laughs> really, really, you know, bet in the farm when he thought he was right um and and take took huge swings right you know he'd have huge huge wins but you know then he would he would really have some pretty pretty big losses too and you know so i basically would just kind of trade with them and follow them on their trades but i can't say i really knew what we were doing which was you know kind of my mistake and i got into a hole initially um and then i found this guy well really my mother had introduced me to how to make money in stocks she'd given me the book probably two years prior i'd never read it because you know it's got the 1995 on the front and you just kind of think like it's it's not a book you you should really read um but i ended up finding this guy on twitter by the name of trader florida you know that was just an acronym i, I don't even know who he is just just some guy who basically posted put videos up every night and he mentioned the book. I knew I had it. So I read it and my whole kind of thought process on how I was going to approach the market changed. And I was kind of a sponge. I just watched this guy's stuff every single night. 
I learned about chart patterns, price action, volume. Um, I think I joined the Dan Zanger, uh, you know, got his newsletter, just continued learning and taking all that stuff in. I mean, I've read hundreds of books. I got a bookshelf behind me, probably three, 300 trading books on it at least. Um, and I just soaked everything up and I, and I slowly started to have some success and I, and I started actually making, making money. Um, unfortunately the, the fund I was at, <laughs> they, they, we blew up in the 2011, uh, sell off, you know, specifically when a lot of commodity stocks got hit because we traded a lot of BHP Rio, you know, between London and, and Australia, a lot of Aussie dollar. And, uh, so that was kind of the end of that. And I, and I went and I ended up getting a job at a, at a big execution firm through, through a guy I went to, or through a guy who went to the same college as me, which was really a great job for me to learn because I worked on what was called an outsource desk. Um, so we traded for big funds, you know, I'm talking, you know, billion dollar funds, you know, I, I traded a stock where literally we bought, you know, 20% of the company over, over like nine months, just buying millions of shares. So I kind of got to see how big institutions really work orders, get things done. And I worked specifically for one guy who he was an execution trader, but he also had a lot of interest in the market. He traded a lot of futures. Um, and it, it's not so much that I learned a ton from him about trading, but the enthusiasm was there um, that kind of spurred me to just continue to learn, continue to learn. I started trading my own personal account. Um, and started really having some success growing my accounts. Um, so I worked there for a couple of years and then I sort of, you know, made the mistake of going to sell mutual funds where it, it, it sort of hampered my ability to trade. We had, you know, 30, then 90 day holds a couple, a couple of years later, um, which was tough for me, but in hindsight, it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because I would buy stocks that I thought were, you know, breaking out, and they might go up and I couldn't sell it. And then, and then they might reverse and, you know, I'd sell like a big winner at a huge loss or sometimes they'd go way down <laughs> and then they'd come back. Like it was, it was all over the place, but it was almost like I had to go through every emotion of, you know, having a position on and not being able to do anything about it. Um, and it's what happened is I really got to kind of see how the, how stocks work and move around different support and resistance levels um, and really the 10 and 20 period moving average, which is basically the, the you know, the, the key indicator you could say that I use today. Um, and I got to kind of see price action, how it was supported on it and up moves, how when it broke it, it might accelerate to the downside, how it might resist, uh, you know, on them in, in downtrends. And I probably wouldn't have really actually seen that if I wasn't forced to hold positions without the ability to, to get in and out of them. Um, so basically from there, I, I kind of built this strategy, just almost like paper trading. Like I would have positions on, but you know, sometimes I'd want to get out of it and I'd still be holding my position, but I was kind of working this strategy and, and, and getting it going. Um, and then from there I, I left and I started selling software and I started really trading my money along the lines of that strategy. And I, I actually still, still didn't have much success, uh, because everything worked, but it was my first time actually truly applying it. And, you know, that's when the human emotion and, and stuff like that comes into it. So that was kind of the next step for me was, was, you know, tackling that, that part of the process. And just over time, I started to have faith in my strategy, what I was doing and, and things started to click. And I, I think it's almost like kind of once you figure out your strategy, you, you, you kind of have exponential growth, you know, you may go nowhere for five years. And then, you know, over the course of like two to three years, you, you, you really, really accelerate and, and start to have confidence in what you're doing. You know, you're not really relying on what other people are, are saying anymore. Like maybe you were when you were starting. Um, and for me, that was, that was kind of the, you know, the, the high level 30,000 foot flyby on, on kind of how I learned to trade. Interesting. I, I just want to pick up on something there. I mean, it's a tremendous story, a, a growth mindset story of keep on learning and, and, you know, keep challenging yourself and, you know, don't get stuck in bad habits. Just, you know, just reinvent, you know, we have, we have stumbling blocks, but 
You talked about human emotion. How did you tackle that human emotion, though? Well, so one of my main issues starting out, and this really was when I was at that that fund, um, I I had trouble making money because I, I my stops were too tight. Like a lot of people can't cut their losers. <laughs> I was the exact opposite. Like I I was so scared to lose money. Part of it because you know my dad my dad blew up twice and. You know, the second time it really affected affected my life. So I, I think I kind of approached the market with a lot of fear, if you will. Um, and I had to overcome that. So that was the the main thing for me is, you know, accepting risk, you know, like, hey, you, you really can't make money. You know, so what do they say? Scared money doesn't make no money. And I was really scared. <laughs> I, I was scared to lose money initially. And then when I had a profit, you know, I didn't want to I didn't want to lose my profit. Um, and I would say the funny thing is, you know, now I'd say one of my you know, biggest skills is in a good market. I have the ability to, to risk open gains to, to make bigger gains. So it's kind of funny how just that's all changed. But initially, I was I was scared like I couldn't hold a winner and I I was unwilling to really let anything get going in the first place because I was just using way too tight a stop. So I was just kind of having death by a thousand tiny, tiny cuts um, versus putting a position on and trusting your analysis and, and, and giving it a chance to work. It's all about lessons, right? I and mean, when these these lessons, the lessons of pain almost become so important to to, to deal with. Um, everyone talks about trading and let's guess when, let's guess when, and how am I going to win more? But actually, you need to, you need to go through that, that those dark days, really. You know, the, the dark days of what, you know how you manage to actually, you know, how you need to step away occasionally. And I, and I guess you you may have had times when you, when you needed to step away, you had to sort of get yourself back out of it to get yourself back into it. Did it? Oh uh, yeah, right? yeah. I mean. There was a period probably when I when I went to sell software where I where I actually like I, I almost gave up on the market. I got more into real estate. But then you kinda I kinda realized, you know, how much I really loved the whole puzzle of the stock market and you know I just love it and and I just didn't have the passion for other things. So I would come back to it. Um but I but I do think really the only way to learn to trade is to trade. Um, you know, a lot of people you know, you can go sign up for a, for a, a newsletter or, or whatever, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can get a mentor. Um, but, you know, I don't really think any one person trades the exact same way as another. So you have to trade, figure out what resonates with you. You know, are you a day trader? Are you a swing trader? Are you a position trader? Um, you know, how emotional are you? And then you almost kind of have to troubleshoot, you know, figure out where you're messing up. And you just kind of come up with rules and ways to protect yourself from, uh, you know, caving into your negative tendencies. Um, and that comes with trading and, 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 and figuring out what you're doing wrong and, and building a strategy, you know, around that. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's any shortcuts. I mean, I have heard of some people who have, you know, had great teachers and have learned to trade very quickly, but that, you know, that definitely wasn't my experience. You know, it's great, and it's a great story to hear. Um, and you know, we're we're focusing a little bit with this this podcast today on on that journey to mastery. And that there seem to be so many milestones for you on that journey, so many different experiences, uh, and and a sort of period of almost evolution. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I you know, I think it was just like years of pain, and uh, and you know, the other thing is too, you know, I have four siblings, and they all grew up same household as me you know they they a lot of them you know i'd be struggling and some of them are invested in me and you know they stayed invested in me but at the same time like i I doubt they really believed (laughs) (laughs) because you know my dad had made a lot of money and then you know he lost it all right and so you know a lot of my siblings probably think you know it's kind of gambling or a scam or, or whatever you might call it um, but you know, for me, I just kind of kept my head down, kept going. And, uh, you know, they're, they're most, for the most part, they're all still invested in me now. So <laughs> one, one of the things that stood out for me in, in your, um, 
when you gave us that kind of sort of biography was you mentioned uh, William O'Neill's book. How to, yeah. it's, it's one of the classic books of trading. Um, but you, you kind of said that it was, you know, and I think it was written, I'm not sure when it was written, was it in the 80s it was written? Or maybe even earlier? Yeah, maybe earlier, 70s, 80s. I, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Um, but it kind of says, you know, I mean, the classic books are the classic books and they don't change through time. You know, they're, obviously they're updated. There's an, there's a little bit of, you know, the markets change a little bit, but the basic mess, the core messages are always the same. And, you know, whether it's, you know, reminiscence of a stock trader, um, the, the, the market wizards books, Mark, you know, Mark Douglas, th these, some of these books have timeless messages. Yeah, I mean, I think in a nutshell, regardless of what type of trader you are, the, the general rules are the same, you know, keep your losses small, you know, let your winners be a, a multiple of your losses for sure. Um, I mean, you know, that that right there is, is a lot of trading. Now, now the question is, okay, how do you do that? <laughs> and for, for every person, the how do you do that is going to be a little bit different. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm a big Livermore guy. He's probably somebody who's had the you know biggest influence on me. I, I think some of the, you know, messages that are in his books are, are certainly timeless. And you, and you know, you see those same messages show up in the, in the market wizards interviews, um, all, you know, it's, so, so I totally agree. I, I think a lot of the, you know, principles of trading are, are certainly timeless. And, and one of the other things that stands out for me is, is, you know, there's an awful lot of people and, you know, myself and Mark, both of us, we get messages from people who are saying, do you know what, I've been doing this now for nearly two years and, and it's not working yet. And I'm thinking of giving up and I'm like, two years, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. get real, you know, what, what unrealistic expectations did you have to start with? You know, I mean, it, it, it's such a long journey, you know, it's so many years and, you know, there are some people that start turning a profit early. They're really rare. And, and I often find that they get caught out a little bit later on because, you know, that, that there's a shock waiting for them out there that they haven't seen yet. Um, yeah, exactly. And <clears throat> I think part of the reason why it takes a while to learn and like be able to sustainably make money is because, you know, there's so many different market environments, right? So, you know, you may trade a you know, 2011 type market that's real choppy that, you know, it's maybe kind of like the market we've had the last year and a half or so, or you may trade a, a 2020 market where it's just rip roaring higher, um, you know, or, you know, and, and so when you trade different markets, you have recall. And I think when that type of market comes around again, because you've seen it, you're, you're better prepared to, to try to trade it. Um, so I do think, you know, kind of one of your things was talking about trading mastery. I think having the ability to apply, you know, different different strategies in a way to different types of markets um, is one of the, the key skill sets. But if you can't identify the different types of markets, you know, you're not really sure how to trade them. Um, so, you know, you can't learn that stuff overnight. You, you, you know, you can go study market tops you can go study the 15 16 chop market you can study you know the 13 market when we ripped or, or whatever but there's a difference between studying and actually going through it and, and living it um but once you go through it you know hopefully you can have recall the next time a similar market comes around and you kind of understand how to trade it um you know everybody says hey just go to cash during a correction right but you know, then you get a correction and, you know, the market looks like it's setting up, but then it fails. Right. And, and you know, how do you have the experience to understand not to play that or, or to sit out or, or short it, you know, um, and that all comes from experience. And, and what do we have, you know, one, two, you know, little corrections a year, you know, every year or two, you get a, a bigger correction, you know, so you only have so many opportunities to even get that experience. Right. Mm. Um, mm. So. You know, to me, that's why it takes it takes a while to learn. And on top of all that, not even just the experience, it's one having a strategy in the first place. Um, I think a lot of people don't really have a strategy or at least not something they really believe in, because that's that's key. You know, you got to have a strategy, but you really actually got to believe in it. Um, and then, two, it's just, you know, you have to have applied it. Um, 
so that, you know, again, so that you really trust it and, and believe in it. Um, so, you know, uh, I mean, there's a million reasons why, why it takes a while to learn how to do this, but those are just some of them. And, and one of the things I want to go back to what Mark said before, um, the, the idea of pain, because I, I think that trading, the two words trading and pain go very well together as you know, anyone who's ever done this job would know. Um, and I, you, you really do learn through pain, but it also becomes, uh, you know, a kind of, it makes you, it makes you cautious, obviously, which you need to be, you need to respect risk. You need to respect the market. And the other time it can then become painful when you actually leave money on the table and miss out and see things happening. So there's a different sort of pain going on there as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're sort of always in a little bit of pain, <laughs> Yeah. you know, pain in that you, uh, you know, took a bad trade and you took a hit or whatnot, or kind of like you said, you know, maybe you had a good opportunity and you, and you didn't pull the trigger. And, and, you know, you knew you should have, but, you know, what are you going to chase now? And it's kind of like you're you're torturing yourself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny. I had somebody who reached out to me, you know, asked me for some advice. I gave him some advice and kind of like what you said after six months, you know, they they weren't making it rain. So they they, they couldn't understand why. Um, but then the other thing they said is like, don't you ever get lonely? And I said, well, hey, this is this is a lonely profession. You know, it's not a team sport from from my perspective. And uh, so there's some of that going on, too. You know, you, you've got to be comfortable working alone. Um, you know, I know some some prop shops and stuff think it's a team sport or whatever. I, that's not really how I trade. Um and you've just got to be comfortable making your own decisions, living with the, the consequences of your decisions um, and, you know, just kind of having flexibility to change your mind, obviously. Um, and then certainly when you're wrong, you know, like getting the heck out. <laughs> you mentioned just a moment ago about the need to keep your head down and keep going at times. Yeah. But do you think some of that from your own sort of tenacity to sort of stay in the market and believe in the, the process and the system and your and your strategy do you think some of that goes back to the days when you were a quarterback because i started to pick up this thing that you know you were you know a pretty good sportsman right and the, some, yeah. of those, some of those qualities do, yeah do i think for sure I think it all kind of comes back down to like grit and mental toughness um like you know the things don't oftentimes most of the time things aren't always going going perfect for you in the market and if you're gonna just you know fold then you're not gonna make it in this business like no way um because at least me i mean i can go through you know month multi-month periods where i feel like just like you know even if i'm making money i'm frustrated like things just aren't going well like I, i'm not maximizing what i'm doing and I'm and I have pretty high expectations for myself. So a lot of the time I'm frustrated, even when I am trading well. Um, and if you don't have the ability to push through that and kind of keep going, especially when things are going poorly. I mean, this is not definitely not the business for you. Um, so I think for me, a lot of that comes from sports and that, you know, with sports, especially at the college level, just the work ethic that goes into it. Um, and then, you know, I faced some adversity just growing up, you know, obviously, uh, you know, my life, my life changed a lot when my dad blew out and, you know, things weren't always the easiest. And so I think kind of that's ingrained in, in my trading, probably that, that grind, grind approach, just grind it out, you know, make it happen. Oh, you're struggling. All right. Put in the work tonight. Trust the process. You got to love the process. Um, and just kind of having faith that, you know what you're doing. And if you keep going, you keep your losses small, eventually you're going to string some things together and you're going to go on a big run. Um, you know, that's kind of how, how I am. If I can kind of keep my account, you know, within shouting distance of highs, you know, even when things aren't, aren't going great, you know, I know I'm going to go on a run. You know, it may, it may, it may be a week from now. It may not be three months from now. You know, you never know. Um, but that's my mentality. You know, keep the account in your highs uh cut your size when when you're not trading well and then when things start coming back together 
you know, eventually I'm going to go on a run. I mean, for sure. That's always my mentality. I don't care how long I'm, 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 I'm not stringing things together. My mentality is, you know, that next run is just around the corner and, and you just don't know when it's going to come. Um, but I think you have to, you know, in some way have that approach. Yeah. It's, it, I call that the, uh, the London buses theory, which uh, it used to, it used to play in my mind when I was a trader that I could go long periods of, underperformance not getting a winning trade you know there was a lot of sort of death by a thousand cuts which you sort of mentioned going on there but there was this uh, when, when when mark will remember this when we were young the london buses were notoriously <laughs> unreliable and you could you could wait you know the timetable said that they're, they're coming every 20 minutes but you could wait two hours and then all of a sudden three or four come along at once and you're like <laughs> what are these guys doing they all stop for a coffee or a drink at the pub or something on the way and then all left together and 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 if you run out of patience you end up missing them because you think i'll go to a different bus route by the time you do they all turn up and those ones are not coming and it was yeah so for, for me i used to tell myself this job is like a london bus the london yeah bus I mean, it's, a good analogy. it's a good analogy yeah but that, that used to get me through those quiet periods you know just don't worry steve it's going to come along it, you know if you believe in yourself like you say if you have a good process if you have a strategy um and you keep things tight um you know that 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 will happen yeah i mean yeah that's my approach like no doubt about it i have confidence in myself um even when i go through long long droughts i have confidence that i'm gonna come out of it for sure um there's no doubt in my mind <laughs> now one of the things for people listening out there is they, they must be sort of hearing you some of them and going this is oliver Kerr, 941 percent in one year <laughs> you know stock investing world champion he goes through droughts <laughs> yeah you know, I mean, that's kind of one of the worst parts about winning that competition is you know people don't think you make mistakes when you know i'm like a walking mistake <laughs> uh so you know yeah that's the reality of trading is you know you're making more mistakes than than you're not for you know i, I, I love that because you know i try and tell people you know 25 years i mean I probably placed my first trade in 1986, so you know, too too many years ago. But you know, I, I I don't trade for a living anymore, but I call it my fun money pot still, and I still trade, and I still don't do some things that I think rookie error, Steve. You know, <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> you yeah, I, I make rookie. I mean, you know, re realistically, I'm probably pretty early in my trading journey. I mean, I'm, you know, I guess I've been trading for what like 12 years or so but realistically uh you know trading 100 percent for income like with the family been about a year and a half i mean i traded for income previously when i prop traded and such but you know it's just me which i think there's a big difference when you've got like a wife and a kid and you're trading and like you got to make money <laughs> uh and so I, I view it like I'm still pretty early in my journey. I mean, I've had some success. Um, I definitely think I know what I'm doing, but I, you know, I'm learning every day. Like, you know, I, I don't think you really ever stop learning. I think when you talk to a lot of the great traders who have had longevity, you know, they've been trading 20, 30 years, you know, they, they they all say that, you know, you're learning every day, you're learning every day. Um, and so, you know, those guys have been doing it for 30 years are still learning, you know, me doing it for 10 years, like I should be a sponge. And that's, that's, that's how I approach it. Um, and, and that's what makes it fun too. I love it. You know, I love the fact the market's always different and you're always learning and finding new opportunities, putting the puzzle together. It, it's great. Yeah. That curiosity is so important, right? And it, it drives you. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's good to be part of it and be part of the ticker tape, as it were, and try and understand the patterns, be they fractal patterns, and understand yeah. that the fractalization of the market exists from from the grand long-term charts right down to the moment-by-moment -moment charts. You get to see these things. I yeah, want to so talk about 2020, okay, the 1,000% year. Let's call it the 1,000% yeah. year. What could you have done better in 2020? Number one question. Right. <laughs> Number two question, what was the biggest lesson you learned 
in 2020? Uh, well, could have done better. I mean, I had a pretty big drawdown in, I think it was September, you know, going into October. Um, just kind of got chopped up a, a little bit. It happened pretty quick. Um, and I would say the biggest lesson, I'd say two things. One, you know, that drawdown, really, I had like a bad three day period where I got smoked. <laughs> and then I, uh, you know, and, and, and so I guess the lesson there is, you know, you can you can mess things up you know, pretty bad in a, in a short amount of time. Um, but two is just on the upside of things, you know, people hear that number, you know, it's a big return or whatever, but it's a lot of little returns, you know, over time, um, you know, good trading is a grind. Um, you know, I think, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but I think to do a thousand percent return, you got to do about 22% a month, you know, something like that. Um, which, you know, if you break that down, you know, hey, can I do 5% a week? Um, and I think that's really how you put up big returns is, you know, having little returns consistently. Um, and I think that's a key, key thing to take away because, you know, realistically, well, I shouldn't say realistically, I, I think people should have whatever goals, you know, they want to have. But I think, you know, for me, one of my first goals is, you know, to, to double my account each year you know that's something that i feel like i should do you know that's i should do that every year and in, in my eyes um and if i don't you know then i then i failed um but basically i think to to do that you know you break that down and the numbers even smaller right and and so you know understanding that good trading is just putting up you know little numbers if you will consistently and, you know, you can't be trying to make like a thousand percent at one time or you're never going to get to your goal. You're, you're probably going to lose money. Um, so trading's a grind, you know, being consistent, working your process, having patience. Patience is huge. You know, waiting for those right opportunities. You know, maybe there's two to three just huge opportunities a month, maybe only two. And if you actually have the patience to just wait and hit those opportunities hard, I mean, you can easily do 20% a month if you if you really rock those specific opportunities and you don't chew yourself up, you know, with with sub subpar uh, opportunities. Um, so I think, you know, that's a key thing or two, two things there. One, you can you can really mess things up pretty quickly, you know, in a short amount of time. And then two, you know, good trading is a grind um, and just trying to string together wins. Um, compound them over time. You know, everybody should have a compounding calculator and an Excel sheet or something and run those numbers on a weekly or monthly period. And you'll see that, you know, the guy talking about, you know, making 20% in a day or whatever, you know, those are rarely the guys that are, are putting up, you know, consistent big returns over the course of the whole year because their accounts are usually just crazy volatile in general. Yeah, it's, I think it was Jared Tendler who said it's a game of inches. And yeah, you're, yeah. You just inch and inch along. For um, sure. And they all add up. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating hearing you again because I, I'm, I'm think you know, coming back to this, this sort of trader's journey uh, from apprenticeship to mastery and what you were saying about always learning. You know, in a, in a sense, you're always an apprentice in this job. You know, you, it's, it's just that's the nature of it. And, and I think there's a danger in thinking you're a master sometimes because that's when you get your ass whipped. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, definitely don't think I'm a master. Uh, you know, I get humbled by the market regularly. Um, I kind of view the market as like the ocean, you know, like, uh, yes, you know, I, 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 I like to sail, you know, I sail with my dad and, and stuff and we've done a lot of ocean stuff and, you know, you can be on the biggest boat in the world, but when you're out there in the middle of the Pacific or wherever you're at, you know, you're, you're an ant, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, a, you're a piece of sand on the beach and the ocean will slap you around. Um, and it's the same thing with the market. I mean, if you, if you don't show the market respect, if, if you, you know, fight a downtrend because you think you're in a, you know, the stock that's going to go to the moon, you know, it'll run you over. And next thing you know, you, you know, you lost half your account. Um, so, having the respect for the market always. And, and, and I mean, that's key. That's like one of the number one things, you know, if you want to, if you want to trade. 
Do you, do you have a key set of rules that you live by, like a small set that, you know, if I break those, I'm in trouble? And uh... Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, my strategy revolves around something I call the price cycle. And it's just kind of how I, you know, see the price action work around the 10 and 20 period moving average. Um, and, you know, within that, I'm, you know, using specific chart patterns. I'm using relative strength and, and things like that to get in and out of the market. Um, you know, so uh, specific rules, um, I have rules on, on drawdowns and cutting my size, and then I have my strategy. And I would say you kind of put those two together, you know, those are kind of what I use to, to run my business, if you will. And what, where, I mean, where is your edge? You could, so you've got your strategy, but you know, other people can be using the same strategy as you and, and not doing as well. Or maybe sure. you're doing better, you know, who, yeah, who knows? Absolutely. But, you know, wh where would you define, th there's a lot of, you know, one of the things that we come across a lot is uh, people are using more or less the same strategy, but maybe only one of them is making it work. So so that yeah. person's got an edge that's not really the strategy itself. The strategy puts them in to the market and, and gives them a chance of winning, but there's something they're applying. Well, I think in reality, you know, if you go on Twitter, most people are trading the exact same stocks, you know, for the most part, not, not always, but you know, a lot of the time and, you know, some people are making money and some people are losing money. Um, and some of that, a lot of that just comes down to experience, you know, kind of understanding how to execute. Um, you know, I think, you know, for example, we just had like a three to four day move off the lows. Yeah. Like, in their stocks that look like they're going to go higher but you know that doesn't mean you just run out and buy them you know if you're trying to buy strength right now you're probably getting chopped up whereas if you're you know trying to buy support you know you're probably having more success um whereas you know maybe four days ago um just kind of understanding how the market was set up you know maybe you were you were bearish or whatever but when we didn't push lower having the flexibility to to take the market long um, you know, some people might get married in a direction and, you know, that can, that can really hurt them at turning points. Um, but really I think the key is, at least for me, is just keep your losses small, you know, work your strategy because kind of once you get on something that works, you can make, you know, such a significant multiple versus your, your risk that, you know, you're going to more than cover your losses. And then I think the other thing is identifying, you know, the market environment. Um, so I've done a pretty good job this year. This year I did a great job, I think, identifying, you know, we were in a, a, in a downtrending market. You know, I, I think potentially that's changing right now. Um, but, you know, I wasn't really taking any long trades. I was, I was more short in the market. I just want to jump in at this point to make it clear that this episode was recorded in in the second half of March 2022, and we're actually broadcasting this in early June 2022. So um, some of the comment being said at this point in the episode, please make sure you, you, you realise that the relevance isn't contextual to what's happening now. Obviously, we've seen quite a bit, bit of distress in the market in recent weeks. We've seen quite a sell-off in, uh, in stocks and a number of other asset markets. Um, so it... it Please just be sure that what, what Oliver is saying here is not a trade recommendation. He's just talking about the current context of the market as it was in March 2022. We'll return to the podcast shortly. The AFMAN podcast is sponsored by TradeStation Global and the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. TradeStation Global is a multi-asset trading platform with access to international markets where you can trade a range of instruments from one account and leverage professional grade tools like Radar Screen, The Matrix, and Easy Language. And with TradeStation Global, there are no hidden price spreads, just transparent, low commissions. To find out more and to open an account, visit tradestation-international.com forward slash alpha mind or go to our website, alpha mind.net or see the link in the episode description. The Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, provide world beating technical analysis education programs and offer outstanding membership services. AlphaMind podcast listeners can obtain a 10% discount on the cost of their excellent home study course and home study course with a diploma package. To find out more about this offer, go to our website alpha-mind.net or see the link in the episode description. Now back to the podcast. You know, I'm still kind of working on holding my shorts. It's something I haven't traded, you know, too many extensively negative tapes 
Um, so I did a little bit more day trading um, and just kind of recognizing, you know, that was going to pay over trying to force long trades in this market. Um, whereas one thing I didn't do a great job of is in 2021, you know, there wasn't a ton of follow through on breakouts and, and, and such. So, you know, I would I would get in a position, I'd be in the money and I'd give half my profits back um, and I would never really get my account like moving like crazy. And, you know, probably I should have been taking more day trades and, and you know, shorter term trading to keep my account moving. Um, but just identifying those different environments and then tapping into the proper tool sets you have to take advantage of those types of markets is is key. Um, so. Yeah. How broad is your radar that you're looking at? The, are you following like the usual stuff or are you starting to look at the unusual for opportunity? When you say the unusual, what do you mean? Yeah, the stuff that a lot of people, a lot of people tend to follow the same, you know, 10, 10 stocks because everyone's kind of there. It's very topical. Yeah. But do you go off radar and kind of off piece into these edges where there's other stocks out there that maybe people are not paying so much attention to, but there clearly is opportunity there? Sure. So, I mean, I trade, you know, I trade a lot of the big cap, what I consider to be the leaders of the market. So, you know, probably the two stocks in particular that I've traded a lot of the last couple of years have been Tesla and NVIDIA. Uh, but then, you know, I, I, I was more focused on the short side on a lot of, the you know, old growth names, if you will, you know, the archetype stuff. But now coming out of this correction, you know, I personally still think Tesla and NVIDIA are, are leadership type stocks. So, you know, there'll be stocks that because I'm literally trading them all the time, you know, they're kind of the cores that I have. But I'm looking for new opportunities coming out of a correction. Um, so, you know, things like Bros, ACLS, um, just new names that maybe hadn't really heard of or traded in the past um, that have held up well and are you know look like they could lead off the bottom um you know i want to try to get into those opportunities um well also you know trading some of the names that i consistently trade um so kind of a combination of the two i am not really the guy who is going to be trading like an off the radar stock that trades like 150,000 shares a day because it's got a nice pattern I, i'm much more comfortable in liquid type stuff um, but coming out of corrections, you know, I kind of mix the two, you know, the names that I consistently trade that I'm comfortable with and, you know, how can I pepper in, you know, maybe three or four of those, you know, new opportunities that are near highs that have held up extremely well during the correction that I think could really lead us, you know, to the upside, you know, how can I get on those, you know, even if, so for example, there's a couple names now like GFS, which, you know, I definitely, I didn't get on this thing and it's moved pretty you know, significantly here at the gates, but, you know, how can I maybe try to pick that up on a pullback? Um, because I think it's the type of name that, you know, just based on its relative strength could, could be a leadership type stock. Um, so I kind of mix the two. And then also, you know, I do watch the commodity stocks. You know, I, I kind of have my list of growth names. I mostly trade growth stuff, but I think, you know, kind of from my R days and, and stuff like that, you know, I keep another list of, you know, the different sector type stocks, you know, my my metals and miners, my steels, my financials, et cetera, um, the oils. And so a lot of that stuff's been working really well. Um, you know, a lot of the, you know, you see the moves in wheat, soybeans, oil, et cetera. Um, you know, you're seeing big moves in those commodity stocks as well. Um, and I remember, I guess it was probably like, you know, 2011, 12, 13 or so. You know, we saw big bull markets in, in the coal stocks. You know, I remember Massey Energy and our resources. Those things don't even exist anymore. But they were they were, uh, you know, they were great stocks. So it's not like these stocks can't go on extended upside moves. Um, I will say I'm much more comfortable trading the growth stocks, but I'm paying attention to these names. And if I got one right, um, you know, usually more off support, um, then I would I would I would totally hold it just just like any other name the key is to get it right because they can have you know they can have big shakeouts and oliver coming back to this idea of of trading mastery um and you know in your 12 years you've had a hell of a lot of different experiences by the sounds of it you've worked with some really good people you've seen maybe some people who i don't know whether they run lucky or 
you know, they, they, they did silly things or, you know, but you would have had exposure to some great traders as well in that time. Sure. What, what do you consider the essential qualities of someone who's perhaps on their way towards mastery, if not there already? Yeah. So I thought about this a little and I, I wrote a couple of things here. Uh, you know, I think one is <clears throat> having different strategies or skill sets for different types of markets. Um, now for me, those different types of strategies or, or, or setups, I should call they they revolve around the same general concept of my price cycle. It's more just applying some different things around that same general uh, concept to approach the market. Um, and then I think having the ability to, to take the market long and short, um, you know, I'd say I'm mostly long, but I but I think, you know, having the ability to go short the market when when, you know, it sets up that way is, is a skill that is important. Um, I know a lot of people disagree with that, but but I, I think that it's important um, because I think it helps you stay in tune with the market. You know, if you're shorting stocks and it's working, well, then you're not going to try to get long stocks because shorting them is working. Um, and then I think having the ability and discipline to recognize those changes in the market. Um, you know, if you've got different strategies, but you don't know when to apply them, you know, they're, they're not going to be that useful to you. So you got to be applying the correct concepts in the correct environments. Um, and then I think balancing the risk of drawdown, you know, versus sizing the correct opportunities. Um, so, you know, I kind of view that as the ability to be aggressive, um, but controlled aggression, right? You know, to really knock it out of the park when you have a good idea, you have to put more size on. But with that comes more risk. So, you know, how do you balance that properly? Um, you can't just, you know, swing for the fence on every single trade or you're, or you're going to get into trouble. Um, so on the opposite side of that is the discipline to size down and manage your drawdowns when you're in a hole. Um, so, you know, kind of balancing those two is key. Um, you can't always be, you know, going 150 miles an hour. You know, sometimes there's a stop sign, right? Um, and then, you know, having the humil humility to admit when you're wrong. Um, you know, one of my my football coach in college used to always say when we'd watch film on Monday, um, you know, it was never as good as you thought it was and you were never as bad as you thought you were. <laughs> um, and oftentimes, Brilliant. you know, the difference between your great game and your bad game was just a couple little things here and there. Um, so, you know, the key is, you know, how, how do you control your emotions on the upside and the downside? I, I try to stay pretty even keeled, you know, kind of one of my goals every day is you know when i go play with my kid after the market or whatever you know he doesn't care if i had a good day or a bad day he's happy to see me either way um so i don't want to bring frustration into that and i you know i i just want to be the same every day right you know i just want to be dead right and i think that's important for people to, to to be able to do that um and then i think the last thing is you got to have high expectations for yourself um, you know, I think when I was first starting to trade and obviously you see these big hedge funds that run billions of dollars or whatever. And I think kind of the, 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 you know, the general, like, oh, if you 20% a year, you know, you're, you're, you're the man, right. Or Stan Druckenmiller did 30% for 30 straight years. And, and that's great. That's great. And those guys are awesome. But, you know, for the most part, most of us aren't running billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think like comparing yourself to those people is, is doing yourself justice. Um, like you've got to have different, in my opinion, much higher goals if you want to have higher returns. Um, Cause like, if you don't believe you can do it, you're not going to do it. Um, so, you know, I think that's a key, key, key thing aside from all the strategy, et cetera, is like having big goals and believing you can achieve them. Yeah, it's an interesting one, actually, that, that hedge fund, because I work with a few hedge fund guys. Um, I think Mark does as well. And, and we, you know, they're, they're, their numbers are very low in terms of return. But there, there's a kind of a, a, a misrepresentation or misunderstanding that, you know, they, they don't have that, you know, if someone's running, you know, half a billion dollars, they don't really have half a billion dollars of trading money. That they, yeah. That they're allowed to lose maybe five percent, and after yeah, that exactly. they're out. So really, their trading capital is five percent of that five hundred million dollars. Now that's still quite large. It's not. It's not. Yeah. It's not pocket money, but it, it, yeah, it means that it that way. But that makes sense. Yeah. So so their twenty percent return. You know, I think for a lot of them, 
you know, and they're, they're running very, very conservative money because the money's come from pension funds and uh, sure. um, which, you know, that they themselves sort of have a very conservative profile. But, you know, in other words, you know, if someone's running 500 million, they're really, 5% is the limit. They've got $25 million of trading capital. Yeah. yeah. Well, I so, guess at the end of the day, they're yeah. at the end of the day, I think like I, I'm not trying to compare myself to anybody. No, it's not. But what, what I do say is it's, it's, it's useful to understand that, you know, if, if you're trading with a hundred thousand dollars or you're trading with, it's about that return on the original thing. So like you say, you know, if you can make a hundred percent return, I mean, that, that's phenomenal money every, every single year, you know, but yeah. like, you know, have high expectations. Absolutely. And have, you know, that self-belief as well, which you mentioned there is so vital. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's key. I mean, you you have to, uh, you know, a lot of these hedge fund guys, and and I'm not, you know, not just hedge fund guys, just whoever, um, you know, you know, they've done the work they've done to get to where they're at, right? But you know, you need to recognize, hey, I've done the work to to get to where I am, and like, you know, I believe in what I'm doing. I've I've studied, I put in the work, and and trust your own analysis and. <laughs> And, you know, that's what it comes down to is, is, you know, it's all on you and, and, you know, what are you going to do? You, you know, like for me, I definitely kind of have a chip on my shoulder. You know, I, 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 I view it like I'm going up against everybody and I can beat them. And, uh, and, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. <laughs> Oliver, here's a question for you. You've recently become a, a father, yeah, in the last sort of year or so from what I, I can tell. Yeah, I have an 11 month old. Yep. Has that changed the way you trade? Um, I, I don't know that it's it's changed the way I trade. I, I would say just in general, like I have a massive chip on my shoulder, you know, uh, uh, from some of the things that happened to me. And so I, uh, I operate on a level of intensity that most people uh, probably, you know, don't operate like that. And so I now that I've had a kid, it's almost like I'm trying to kill that chip a little bit, you know, um, which I'm a work in progress there. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, problem, I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more balanced for sure. Yeah. Like, I think it's important. <clears throat> and I also think, you know, I haven't talked to some of my mentors who have probably been similar to me is, you know, to have longevity, you know, the chip and all that is great. But, you know, it can wear you out, too. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm trying to find that balance um, for sure. Was that an eternal motivator for you? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> just, just uh, you know, when my dad blew up, things got a lot harder for us. And, and you know, that so that all that all motivates me. Um, and then I think coming out of college, you know, I was passed up for, for some, some opportunities that, uh, you know, I, I personally thought I, I should have got, um, or at least been given a chance where I, you know, I kind of, you know, th that stuff motivates me, you know, rejection, I think in general, just kind of motivates me, you know, some people get rejected and they, they fold, you know, they feel bad for themselves. You know, I get rejected and I get pissed off. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I want to, I want to prove them wrong. There's another 940 percent coming. You want to come out and get rejected as often as you so. said. I sure hope so, man. <laughs> so how's 2022 so far then? Uh, 2022, you know, I don't know how you say I'm having a good year or a bad year. I guess it depends what your expectations are. I would say, you know, I, I, I've been green, you know, every month, but I, I, I've i underperformed in my eyes. Like I really thought January was one of the best months to trade, you know, probably since January of I guess, 2021, you know, kind of that blow off top. I think there's an enormous amount of opportunity in January. A lot of it was on the short side and I, and I, I just didn't, I didn't maximize my, my shorts the way that I, I should have, you know, uh, which was, was pretty frustrating. Um, but you know, it is what it is. February is a little choppier. Um, but I still think that, you know, it was a, a good month to trade a lot of volatility, but I think you had to kind of shorten your, your time horizon. I, at the beginning of February, you know, put myself in a little hole. So I had to, you know, size down and work my way out of it. Um, whereas if I hadn't done that, I think I could have had a much bigger month. 
And, and I basically did the same thing again in March, uh, which, you know, I, I've worked out of it and, and I, and I think we're turning the corner here pretty good, but um, you know, if I hadn't done that, I, you know, I think I would have had much, much bigger months. And, and then January, I think I really, uh, you know, January, I think was a really, really, really just great month to, 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 to trade. And I didn't, I didn't maximize the way I felt that I should have. So I would say I'd give myself like a, like a C, but I, I have, I, I have a good uh, platform to, to, you know, finish the year strong. You know, we got nine and a half months left here. So things, you know, really kind of just started. <laughs> I just, where, where can people find out more about you, Oliver? Well, so I used to post on Twitter, but I, I'm not really doing that anymore. I just kind of decided that, uh, you know, I have so many followers now. It's it's just kind of a lot to, to handle. Um, but I did I did write a, a book that basically goes through my whole strategy and everything that I do. Um, so that's at keltrading.com. Um, terrific. And you know, so that's I'll I'll, I'll, sh- I'll shoot you guys over that. I thought I sent it. Um, but so that's that's pretty much what I do. And you know, I'm I'm more trying to just stay focused on my trading with less social media and stuff like that. You know, kind of with the competition, I, I, I just had so many people reaching out to me. It became a little overwhelming. Um, so I'm kind of just trying to stay focused on what I'm doing and, and be a little bit less uh, visible, if that makes any sense. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, listen, we'll, 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 put the, we'll put the name of the book on, on the uh, podcast notes. Okay. Yeah, and I'll shoot you guys that over. I, I I thought I'd sent it to you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Brilliant. And Mark, any anything else you want to add? Well, I think it's time to get start to sort of ro- roll this to a close. But there's some some wonderful stuff you're doing, Oliver. That's sort of almost a thought leadership in this space, right? For for people that have almost not come from a pure pro world that were started off in a bit of pro but then found their own way and you know you'll start i, I thought it was very interesting that you know, you're still hanging into the bhp and the rio rio type stuff from the from the early days of your experience in markets and you're still you know, looking at those sectors now and of course both steve and i know the extraordinary um sort of texture and benefit of the commodity markets you know and just how they interact with with equities is, is a fascinating world. And of course, um, certainly one that you've taken full advantage of. But I mean, I, lo- I loved your, your comment, um, you know, have a strategy, I guess, believe in it. And that, that tenacity of just, you know, quarterback attitude of head down and guess push through, keep going, staying with it, learn, fall over, get up carry on you know you're going to touch yeah, that's what this is all about you know and uh, emotions are there to be managed and so you need to have a plan around that and managing the emotion emotional part of the journey but i want, want to leave with a, a, a phrase that you threw in very early on which was scared money makes no money <laughs> that, that's just a, such a phrase to leave people with yeah so kind of understand how you get, how you get around that because people are scared in this space. You know, like 95% of the people lose money. And that scares a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they should be a little scared. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little scared. You know, you overcome it, right? You've you got to respect that as well, though, because yeah, you can't absolutely. ignore it. You get into trouble. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you got to respect it. I mean, that's a that's a funny line, but, it, you know, you got to respect the market for sure. Uh, yeah. Well, at all times, at all times. Yeah. No, listen, this has been great. This has been great. So I, I guess we'll wrap up here then, but uh, it's it's been a pleasure. And I, and by the way, thank you to Chris, if he's still listening, when, we, when this goes live, of course, uh, who put me in touch with you. Um, yeah, for sure. For yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I enjoyed today. You know, happy to come back on anytime. And, uh, you know, if there's any anything I can do to, to help you guys, let me know. Very, very kind indeed. And I, and I think also, I think you did strike upon something also that, I mean, in your earlier part of the career, the the need to have community, the value of community is really, really important. And a lot of people out there in siloed retail space will you know, take it for granted that, you know, that I, could, I can survive in my little closet, you know, doing my stuff. But actually, you, you need to be, you know, sharing your stories and, uh, you know, 
and, and supporting each other, right? Because it's it's tough. So the value of community, and you you reemphasize that, that was really important for you in those those days of trying to work out where you were going. Um, yeah, I think when you're like, learning, it's it's real important. Like I definitely had some mentors, you know, who I still talk to daily today, who helped me learn, and you know, especially when you're really really struggling. Um, when you're learning, because everybody does, even though some people try to pretend they don't. And even when you when you learn how to trade, you still definitely struggle. Like it's a constant struggle. Um, so having people that you can bounce things off of who kind of understand, you know, the game, if you will, it, it, it is huge. Especially, you know, for me, I wake up, I work at my house, you know, I'm alone. You know, it's, it's hard <laughs> in the house for weeks. You know, it's it's good to have people that you can talk to, right? And and uh, you know, I think that's important. Even if you're not always just like talking about trading and ideas and setups, um, you know, just kind of having having a release is important. Well, you go into your head a little bit. You go into yourself. We we were talking about this with our last. Well, we haven't we haven't published it yet, but by the time this comes out, we'd have had our previous one out, which is with Linda, Linda Rushkey. Oh, I, I'll, I'll be looking forward to listening to that. Yeah, oh, it was brilliant. Yeah, but we talk about these great. things. She, she's a, she's also a Pacific, uh, started down on the Pacific Exchange. So Yeah, yeah, I read her book. She was probably, uh, you know, my dad was on the floor at the same time as her. I think he went to the floor in like 75 or something. I, I think, uh, what, she was like the early to mid 80s. Uh, but yeah. her book was great. I mean, so many cool little stories. Trading sardines, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's I've, got, I've got it here. I don't hear because still just the, the interview a couple of days ago and she was brilliant. Yeah, I bet I'd, I'll be looking forward to listening to that. Yeah, and you follow her. So, <laughs> listen, great. I really, we really appreciate you taking your time to come on and uh, speak to our audience and uh, and to share your uh, brilliant insights. You All know, right. and, and to be so open and honest as well. I mean, it's it's a space where a lot of people don't want to talk about what's happening and their struggles and. The difficult thing so you know a really you know huge kudos to you for opening up there yeah, yeah for you... sure you know in reality like everybody everybody even when you're you know like you know realistically like I, i've outperformed this year but like i mean man has it been a, a struggle right <laughs> and and uh you know that's like i feel like kind of how it always is <laughs> it, it is it's you know it, it, as we as we sort of alluded to earlier on you know it's you know, I, I speak to, you know, we, we had a guy on um, who was in the Market Wizards book last year. Was it Shapiro, Jason Shapiro? Oh, uh, yeah. I like listening to him. I mean, he's a realist. Like, he's Yeah, a real. Realist. He's yeah. great. And, you know, once once he got talking, you know, there was, he, he was it's a great episode of people are listening to go back to. But he says, you know, there's days where, you know, he loves his job, but there's days where he just beats himself up and he, you That's know. That's how I am. I mean, I, I love this to death. I, I don't think I could do anything else. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there are times when I just want to, like, you know, bang my head against the wall. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you want the ground to swallow you up, don't you? I mean, I, you know, I, I, the most stupid thing I ever did was probably in my 20th year trading. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, that's and, the thing. You can do this forever. So, like, really, for me, in the beginning of March, I had the same deal. I had a two to three day period where I just screwed myself. And, and now I've, I've made it back, but I, but I, it's like, you know, like, why did I do that? You know? Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, it's, and I know better, kind of like you said earlier, uh, you know, I know, I know better. Why did I do that? What do you think? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it still happens. Right. So, you yeah. know, I guess it just, you never grow out of it, I guess. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, listen, listen, we've, we've all got to move on. I guess you've got to go and see your little child and have a little yeah. uh, show daddy's happy face. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. I appreciate the time. Thank you for listening today. We would like to thank our podcast sponsorship partners, TradeStation Global and the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. You can find out more about our sponsors on our website, alpha-mind.net, or see the link in the episode description. TradeStation Global is a multi-asset trading platform with access to international markets where you can trade a range of instruments from one single account and leverage professional-grade trading tools. Visit tradestation-international.com forward slash alphamind to know more. The Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, provide well-beating technical analysis education programs. Alphamind podcast listeners can obtain a 10% discount off the cost of their excellent home study course. We hope you enjoyed this episode. 
If you did, we'd appreciate it if you could leave a friendly review or provide a rating for the show on whichever podcast service you use. You can find out more about us at our website, alpha-mind.net. You can follow us on Twitter at AlphaMind101 and at AlphaMind102. And you can connect with me, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall, on LinkedIn. You can also follow us and can check back over some of our past episodes on the AlphaMindPodcast.com. We wish you the best of luck in the markets. Have a good week.